And, you know, I have heard often the fact that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but something like 90% of the indigenous population of North America died from disease. That and is true, yeah. Europeans came over. And that just, that blows my mind. I mean, just yeah. imagine 90% of your town perishing. Yeah. I mean, that's apocalyptic. Yeah. And, and that you really... Know, not not all of them perished from, from disease, but many also perished from the very fact, you know, that the whole uh, productive system was disrupted. Uh, there was no no peasants anymore to, to uh, work in the fields and so on. So there was a hunger uh, ep epidemia uh, uh, going hand in hand with uh, the uh, uh, with with the illnesses and so on and so that all uh, really had devastating effects and if we compare it to the pandemics of our own days of course we might we might see the difference this is really the huge democratic demographic catastrophe of human history that is what happened in the Americas in that period. Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war related topics. Uh, today, I am super excited to have on this on the show, uh, Stefan Rinke, who uh, wrote the new book, uh, Conquistadors and Aztecs, A History of the Fall of Tenochtitlan. Um, Stefan is professor and chair of the Department of History at the Institute of Latin American Studies and member of the Friedrich Meinecke Institute at Freie Universität Berlin. From 2014 to 2017, he was president of the European Association of Historians of Latin America. Rinke is the recipient of the Jose Antonio Alzati Award from the Mexican Academy of Sciences, is the author of 14 books, most of which have been translated into Spanish, Portuguese, and English. Stefan, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining me so uh, for joining me today. And um, forewarning for this interview, I'm going to butcher so many pronunciations. Um, before we get started is... Tenochtitlan, that's how we pronounce that, correct? Well, actually, nobody knows uh, exactly how it was pronounced, so don't worry about it. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Tenochtitlan is quite good. Okay, great. All right. Well, since it's such an important topic, uh, I wanted to at least get your expertise on how to pronounce that. Um, and this is, this is another interview that um, I think is going to be fantastic because this is one of those topics that um, so your book is about you know, the the the, uh, the fall of Tenochtitlan and the Spanish conquests in the Americas in the 1500s. We haven't had anybody talk about this yet on my show. We get a lot of World War II, a lot of World War One, and um, you know some of these more these these more well-known conflicts. Um, but this is one of those topics that I knew nothing about. Well, not nothing. I knew like what I learned from school and in the basics. Um, but uh, it was it was such a, a fascinating topic, I thought, and I'm so glad that you're here today talking about it. Um, well, first, would you mind just saying in your own words, you know, what is what is your your book about? Uh, my book is about a global historical event of of great significance, which until the day of today is remembered by almost everyone in the Western world, because it's considered to be a constitutive uh, um, moment in, in our history. It's about the fall of the great empire of the Aztecs or the Mexica people, who dominated large parts of Mesoamerica in that in that period, and who had built up uh, for centuries a strong and mighty empire, and uh, uh, this is so significant because uh, the Europeans who had come to the New World a couple of decades earlier, as we all know, with Columbus in 1492, had until that point not yet discovered. Uh, really well organized empires, but rather smaller groups on the Caribbean islands, which they quickly dominated and, and also unhappily uh, exterminated. And uh, uh, in Mesoamerica, what they uh, 
what they met was completely different. It, 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 it went beyond their imaginations and uh, um, it was uh, a full-blown empire, uh, which was of course very different from what they knew from Europe, but uh, from their own impressions, it also looked uh, impressive, it looked powerful, it had uh, all the ingredients of a, of a mighty uh, civilization of its own, and uh, so uh, these Europeans were amazed and shocked. And, and by bringing down that empire, they really uh, built the fundaments for creating the first phase of European colonialism, which unto our very day is uh, important uh, and influencing our, our own history and present. Well, let's talk about some of the, the history of the time in between um, so the fall of Tenochtitlan happens in, in 1521 and, you know, obvi obviously Columbus came in 1492. So you've got about 30 years, um, uh, a 30 year time period. What's going on in that 30 year time period from the time that Columbus sets foot in the Americas to the, the fall of Tenochtitlan? Yeah, it's a it's a period of trial and error of of Spanish uh, settlement in the in the Caribbean. The uh, Spaniards are continuing to look for uh, the breakthrough to the Pacific. They look for the breakthrough to India, which is has from the very beginning been their objective to reach there, and not not to uh, discover a new continent, which was of course coincidental. And uh, so they are looking, they are looking, they are uh, um, continuing their uh, voyages of, of exploration. Columbus does so many, uh, he does many, many different trips, but there are also very soon other explorers coming uh, to the region and uh, looking for, for this uh, channel, for this breakthrough to really get where they, where they really wanted to go. And that was not uh, the new world, but it was uh, uh, Asia. It was the riches of India and the spices of the Spice Islands and, and uh, China, of course. And so that's what they do. And But, but they also start settling in the Caribbean. And uh, these settlements turn out to be, of course, highly... Um, um, thought about because there are people living there. These are not empty islands, but there are Taino people, there are Carib people and others who set, uh, who have been living on these islands for quite a while. And while some of them were at, at the first moment quite um, uh, welcoming to the uh, foreigners, it soon turned out that uh, uh, convivience would be hard to get and, and that uh, uh, the Spaniards were quite uh, oppressive uh, in their relations with the inhabitants, with the autochthonous peoples. And so it came to the first warfare there. And uh, in these uh, small wars, uh, the Europeans were able to hold their ground and uh, um, they were uh, then enslaving the indigenous pe population. They were exploiting them and they were looking, actually, they were looking for gold. Everywhere they went, they would be looking for gold. And there wasn't that much gold on the Caribbean islands. So uh, they were soon also pretty frustrated. And uh, the, the settlements, the colonization did not bring the desired riches that uh, Europeans were out for. You know, they didn't want to settle permanently in the New World, but they want, they went there in order to get rich and to get back to Spain and have a nice life there. But it turned out that these uh, hopes were kind of frustrated. And uh, so there was this motivation to go on to, to, to uh, continue looking for where the riches really are. And then, of course, uh, by exploring the Caribbean Sea, they would also come across the mainland and uh, they first did so actually in the regions which are now uh, Panama, Costa Rica and so on, and also the northern part of Venezuela and Colombia. And uh, uh, only later did they manage to get to uh, the uh, peninsula of, of Yucatan uh, and uh, um, there of course they already experienced quite a different kind of uh, uh, peoples the Maya people who had a, a highly developed 
um, standard of, of city states and so on. And, and that is what interested them. And then, you know, uh, after having uh, consecutively conquered uh, the islands, also the island of Cuba, which uh, turned out to be a springboard to the mainland, that is then when they, in, in 1519, um, made this step across uh, the Straits of Cuba to, to the mainland. So militarily, what kind of force is um, are the Spaniards? First of all, before before that, are there what are the other? Um, is it just the Spanish in this thirty year time period that are in this region? Yes, it's mainly where well, you know it's all under the uh, rule of the Spanish crown. But the people who go there, of course, Columbus himself was not an original Spaniard, and uh, the sailors he had on board came from all different reasons, uh, uh, regions of Spain, but there was also some slaves, African slaves among them. We know that there were some Jewish people among them whom they took as translators. And, and so, you know, it was kind of a mixed group, but, but mainly is, is they considered themselves to be subjects to the King of Spain. Well, militarily, what, what, was, what was Spain bringing with them um, to the Americas? What, what kind of fighting force, what kind of weapons did they use, their armor, their tactics, the leadership? Talk about militarily the, the situation. Yeah, we have to really go away from this idea that this was a regular military force. You know, this is the image that the Spaniards, Cortes, the leader of the Spaniards, themselves tried to bring across in their histories after after the fall of Tenochtitlan. What it really was, was a, you know, we would call them a gang of mercenaries, a band of, of, of people who uh, put their luck and their fate on this military adventure, and uh, they would uh, 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 gather around the, uh, a strong commander, who, uh, whom they would have to be uh, uh, loyal to. They, uh, they were actually, once they joined the group, um, they were not allowed to, to move away and go back. That was uh, to be punishable by death. So, uh, but what they did was they, in a way, sold their, their power, you know, they sold their uh, um, bodies to this, to this leader, but they also, um, had the right to expect a share of the booty. So what, what it was, was a, a community looking out for booty, a bounty, uh, uh, um, a, a group of bounty seekers, so to say. And they were out, of course, in the main for gold and also for some slaves if they, if they could get them. So that was their main motivation. And, and when they got from Cuba to, to the mainland, it was, of course, also those people who had not had the luck to get a big share of, the, of what was there to get in Cuba. So those were rather the frustrated people, those who had already some experience in fighting indigenous people in the Caribbean islands, but uh, they had not made... Uh, or they had not been, uh, uh, you know, uh, very lucky in that they, they didn't ha have uh, uh, big riches in order to build a life on. So they were still waiting for their next opportunity. And this move to the mainland was their main opportunity. In terms of weapons, uh, they did have, uh, you know, swords. They had iron weapons, which of course, steel, steel weapons, that, which of course was a big advantage later on in the fight against the indigenous people because they did not have that. And they also had some firearms. They had muskets and uh, small cannons. Uh, they also had, uh, animals which were not known in the new world and those were for example horses and dogs you know uh, blood bloodhounds uh, very important in in warfare in the caribbean and and also on the mainland in these early years of european colonization and uh, uh, so and they also had of course armors armory uh, you, you know the, the, the breast uh, armors and helmets and so on. So uh, that was all uh, what they basically, you know, the kind of equipment that uh, people in Europe would also have. And, and of course, this equipment was 
being bought by themselves. So it was their own property. They had to bring it to the, the battlefield. So they were not equipped by some state or by some central agency, but that was their own. Um, usually it was uh, their own uh, uh, equipment. Of course, then also the commander of the uh, of the of that band would also try to equip his soldiers uh, to a different degree and then they would have to to pay that back by uh, uh, not getting as much of the bounty as the others would who had brought their swords and so on so it, it was all a give and take you know it, it was a, a really um quite quite a group you know a heterogeneous group who would get there together and and in doing that they also followed uh, traditions which they had exercised in the peninsula, in the Iberian Peninsula before fighting the Moorish people. So that was not absolutely new to warfare in the New World, but they had already done so before uh, in their fight against the Arabs on the Iberian Peninsula. Now, were most of these these mercenaries or these gangs, were they, obviously it was the Spanish crown they were fighting under, but were they themselves Spanish or did they come from other parts? Well, you know, uh, Spanish is a big word in that in that period. There was not yet a, a unified Spanish state. It was in the making. In in the by the end of the 15th century, there were many um, different measures trying to introduce. You know, uh, a Spanish grammar, for example, what for the first time invented in 1492. Of course, it was also the end of the of the uh, reconquest of the Spanish uh, peninsula from the Arab uh, uh, peoples. And uh, it was also the time of the uh, expulsion of the Jewish and Arab people. So there were many uh, um, different steps in, in trying to turn these very heterogeneous single kingdoms into what we would consider a more modern kind of unified state but um, basically the main uh, um, percentage of people came from the south they came from andalusia they were experienced seamen and uh, but uh, as i said before there were also people from other regions of spain from we don't know exactly each and every one of them, but there, there were African slaves, some African slaves, and, and there were also some Jews who were officially not uh, permitted to join, but they were taken on board because where they were considered to be uh, linguistic uh, geniuses and uh, probably able to, <laughs> to, to talk to the uh, uh, king of China, you know, the Khan, the big Khan, which they were actually heading for. So that was a very heterogeneous group uh, under Cologne. And then later on uh, from the uh, Caribbean, of course, also officially speaking, only Spaniards of, of uh, uh, pure blood were allowed to go to the colonies and uh, who were by that time not yet considered colonies, but rather uh, settlements. And uh, uh, only those of, of uh, pure blood, uh, that is of, of Christian ancestry, who did not have Jewish or Arab uh, ancestors, were officially allowed to go to the New World. And, and uh, we know that that was not always uh, kept, this rule, but uh, we also know that the great majority of people who would go there in this early phase would come from the Iberian uh, Peninsula. Well, let's shift our focus then to, uh, to the Aztecs. Um, and just for for everyone for everyone in the audience who needs a refresher from from high school um could you maybe just like give a brief overview of the aztecs and how big their empire was what its leadership was where on a map specifically um uh, tenochtitlan is um just talk a little bit about the aztecs yeah, the Aztecs were one of those, uh, originally one of those many nomad peoples who in the Mesoamerican region and Mesoamerica, for those who are not familiar with this concept, um, includes uh, what is today Mexico and uh, also parts of the southwest of the United States and uh, uh, the northern part of, of Central America. This is called, uh, has been called uh, Mesoamerica because it is 
uh, considered to be a cultural region, a, a region of unity. And uh, the the Aztecs had originally um, migrated from the north towards the south. Of course, this is all not uh, very well uh, historically uh, documented, but there are these Aztec myths from which we learn that. And and they had finally, uh, after you know many um, challenges and fights and so on, they had. Uh, they had uh, settled uh, at the place where an eagle was uh, sitting on a cactus and, uh, um, you know, eating a, a snake. And, and that was, uh, uh, this is a symbol which is still in the Mexican flag until the very day, uh, until today. And uh, this is a, 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 was a small island in the, the lake of Texcoco. And... Uh, uh, this is a place which they called uh, then later on uh, Tenochtitlan, and they were not from the beginning a powerful people, but they were rather uh, a people which had to pay tribute to their neighbors, and and they were uh, uh, yeah dependent on them, but they were also from the very beginning, at least as that is what their own legends tell us, a very warlike people. They were power, they were good warriors, and so on, and the, and in the in the Courts of many centuries, they managed to come out uh, ever more powerful in this um, landscape where so many different people would would uh, compete and live uh, uh, more or less uh, closely together. And uh, in doing so, their own city state would become more powerful and, and more powerful. And then it would start to expand and uh, also... Uh, um, uh, subdue its neighbors and become the seat of an of an empire. That was a process that really uh, um, started to uh, get very dynamic uh, about 100 years before the Spaniards came. So it was not a, a, a very long. Uh, it's pretty young. Of, would you say it's a pretty young empire then? The it's Aztec a pretty empire? young empire, exactly. They had, and they were still expanding when the when the Spaniards came, and of course, their empire was uh, uh, very much characterized by being uh, an empire uh, which was not only built on their weapons but also on their uh, beliefs, on their religious beliefs, because uh, the Aztecs and many other people in the region believed that. In order to uh, keep the circle of uh, or the exchange of night and day, it was important to uh, sacrifice humans um, uh, uh, and, and to give to feed the gods with human blood and uh, human hearts. And so uh, this was a major part of, of Mesoamerican civilization. As I said, not only the Aztecs practiced that, but other peoples, including the Maya and, and smaller uh, groups too. And um, so that was uh, a major uh, aspect. So when they, when they uh, expanded, when they led their wars against their neighbors and so on, they would make captives who were then sacrificed in ritualistic, um, you know, sacrifices on the big pyramids of um, Tenochtitlan, which by then had been built. Tenochtitlan had turned into one of the biggest cities in the world, actually, in the world. It was not only and by far the biggest city in the Americas at that point uh, in the Western Hemisphere, but it was one of the biggest cities in the world. Yeah, how and big was, by 1500, by the time the Spanish are there, how many people are living under the Aztec? There are different uh, calculations, but uh, we can talk about 200,000, which is okay. really enormous. for Just in Tenochtitlan or in... Just the... in Tenochtitlan, okay. yeah. And, and of course, we're talking about a, a city in an, uh, on an island in a lake. And uh, of course, you know, uh, so the expansion of that city was was kind of restricted, but they still made it. They gained uh, land from the lake by, you know, drying the lake at some at some points and by, by also using parts of the lakes with their 
uh, famous cultivation systems for producing agricultural goods and so on. So they were very, very uh, uh, ingenious in their inventions. They had, they had, uh, of course, uh, this was a, a, a saltwater lake, so uh, they needed fresh water. They built channels for that, and and uh, it is, it was really an amazing. Uh, construction, something that Europeans would never have expected to exist outside the Christian world, because of course they considered themselves to be, you know, uh, the top of 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 creation. And uh, when they found out, oh no, there are other people who can do many things even better than we do, that was really um, shattering their beliefs at that at that point. And and. Uh, yeah, so, you know, there are many different aspects which I could talk about, actually, but perhaps that those are the main ones to to uh, to remember. And of course, it's, it's also interesting that you mentioned high school, because, as I said before, I think uh, for us uh, living in in the Western world, it's still part of our heritage. It's still something we learn in school, although, of course, for European and also for North American like you, it was happened quite far away. But still, it's considered to be part and parcel of our uh, global history. Yeah. And well, I mean, here in in North America, I mean, all over the world, this is the case right now with colonialism. And um, one of the things that's very interesting about your book, too, is there's a real reconsideration of how we have historically, how, how we have taught these events in, uh, in our history, in Western history. Because um, going through school, of course, like we hear the story of the, the conquerors, of the Spanish, of the Europeans who came over. And, and Columbus is this very, you know, exalted figure and... and um, we don't really talk too much about the the different empires that were there. Although, you know, it's I think it's probably well known that that um, you know nobody really thinks that the the conquistadors were the good guys. Um, but you still don't, you know, it kind of stops at at that. Um, I'm curious in Europe how is how is how is Columbus taught in Europe? Well, you know. Uh... That has also uh, uh, underwent some change. It, um, originally, of course, there was this story or this narrative of the big European hero who would go out there and then find the new world and uh, open it up to Christianity and civilization, European style and so on. But then, let's say from about the 60s, 70s onwards, this critical view of Columbus took hold slowly but surely. It took a while, it took some decades to really get into the school textbooks too. Uh, it was more of an academic uh, uh, or university uh, scholar uh, scholarly change of, of opinion first, and it took a while. But then when it finally entered uh, textbooks, you know, it, it turned the whole uh, view of Columbus and the Spaniards around. So now the Spaniards were considered to be the bad guys, the monsters who wiped out uh, uh, indigenous civilizations, uh, which had been uh, wonderful civilizations, peaceful, and what do I know, you know? And of course, that is also a myth which doesn't hold true. <laughs> and uh, we have to consider that uh, what the Spaniards entered into when they came there in 1519 was a very war-torn uh, region where people were out to subdue each other and they were just looking to take advantage of weaknesses the others would offer would show and uh, when they were out to to make captives and to sacrifice them and, and to also, you know, a, a major instrument in, in that region was to have them pay tribute. And uh, that tribute included uh, every kinds of, of um, uh, you know, produce, what have you, but also captives, young women, young men who were supposed to be either slaves or, or also uh, um, to be sacrificed. But of course, you know, it was better to sacrifice people whom, who had been taken captives during a war that was considered to be more, um, it had more honor, you know, if, if you made a captive and offered that guy then to buy a slave and offer them that was not considered to be equal. But, you know, so, so this is a, a very war-torn region where there's almost... Uh, permanent kind of warfare 
And there's always, you know, the, the smaller dependent states who look for their opportunity in order to get out of that, of that situation of, of dependency and oppression. And uh, now when the Spaniards come, they can, of course, take advantage of that and, and they can play one side against the other. And that's what they do. Well, I want to come back to, to, to this when we start talking about one of the things that, that you do learn in school or I remember learning in school is that like, you know, 400 Spanish, like they they took on like this whole empire and they conquered the city and it was because of their technology. Um, but, but you write about how that's a myth. And I, I want to come back to that. But before we, we talk about that, can you just talk about how the Aztecs waged war, um, similar to how we were talking about the Spanish, the types of weapons they used, um, their their equipment, their armor? Um, how was war waged by the Aztecs at this time? Uh, first of all, there was a special season for war, and that was after the uh, um, after the harvest period when people would be free and would have the time. So that's very important. They would not. Wave war, uh, wage war, or all of the all of the year, and they would only do that uh, during daytime, not at nights, because it was considered not, you know, not to be uh, convenient for the gods if you if you would fight by night. So you would do that only during the daytime, and then there were different kinds of wars. There were, uh, of course, the wars of expansion, which a new king, a new Tlatoani, which is, you know, if you translate the word it means speaker the speaker the one who's allowed to speak who's the first who is the tongue of the people so to say uh, which a new Tlatoani had to carry out in order to prove that he was really uh, um, capable of being the leader of the Aztecs so his his uh, own capacities was measured by his successes in war so that's uh, the one thing he had to do these kind of um, wars to prove himself after he had been installed as the new ruler then there are other kinds of wars uh, which were uh, called the so-called flower wars and these wars were not out for uh, or were not uh, led for destroying the opponents but rather to make uh, captives for the sacrifices. These flower wars were especially fought against one uh, uh, group of indigenous peoples, the uh, uh, Tlaxcaltecas, uh, which uh, lived in the city of Tlaxcala, had their own city state in Tlaxcala, which is close to the modern city of Puebla. Now it's still there, Tlaxcala still exists. If you go to Mexico, you should visit it, it's a, it's a great, uh, uh city and uh with a lot of 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 history with some wonderful museums and uh, the tlaxcaltecas were considered to be enemies by the aztecs and they were a small city state but they were not uh, and they were surrounded by aztec uh, by the aztec empire but uh, they were not yet they had not yet been conquered because they were considered to be uh, the opponents in these flower wars. So, you know, they would fight these wars without uh, trying to extinguish their opponents, but rather uh, it was like a training ground for young warriors and, and for also for, for the elderly warriors, for the more mature warriors, in order to, to uh, you know, to keep in training and to uh, make uh, captives. And also the Tlaxcaltecas, although they were few and they were a small state, were considered to be very, very brave and and uh, war a warlike people. So, um, yeah, that, that was a very special phase. But then, of course, the third type of warfare was the warfare of of conquest, uh, of of conquering uh, uh, other city states in the vicinity of. Uh, Tenochtitlan and of course the more the the empire expanded the farther they got to the north and also to the south of Mexico where they would uh, uh, conquer these city states they would burn down the temple usually but before they do they would also take all the the statues the gods and incorporate them into their own pantheon and uh, uh, and and what they would do was they would kill 
the uh, uh, top echelon, the, the elite of this conquered city, but uh, they would not wipe out all the people there, but would rather uh, install a new dependent kind of uh, a rulership uh, who had to pay tribute then. So what they did was they, they established a, a, a sort of dependency and then had these new uh, newly conquered city pay in kind, you know, pay uh, what the region would produce, if, whether it were feathers or or uh, the the skins of leopards and 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 uh, other other uh, materials which were not so abundant in the region of Tenochtitlan, which were considered to be luxury goods. Uh, cacao uh, would also be considered to be a luxury good and so on. So that had to be uh, delivered in a, on a yearly basis and it was quite onerous. So uh, the uh, dependent peoples uh, had to go a long way to produce this tribute. So they so would be held in uh, dependence. If you were just your average soldier fighting in the Aztec Empire, are you? Do you have a sword? Uh, do you have a spear? You know, what's what's your your typical profile of a of a soldier in the Aztec Empire? Yeah, the the army itself was was a very hierarchical um, body, uh, and the top soldiers were uh, you know were really stars. They were really considered to be almost godlike. Uh, creatures and, and instilled by uh, godlike powers, but the regular army, so to say, the the commoners uh, would be equipped with uh, swords and and spears, also with the so-called uh, atlatl, which is a kind of a throwing mechanism to throw spares, you know, with with more power. And they would also have some kind of body uh, wear, you know, in order to protect themselves, which was made of, of uh, um, cotton, uh, big cotton. And actually, the Spaniards later adopted that because it was so much uh, lighter to wear than their iron armors in the heat of Mexico, of course, you know, and uh, uh, so they would wear that. But what they did not have was uh, uh, metal weapons. They had their weapon was made of stone that was sharpened and so on. So it was a deadly weapon, but a weapon that would break quite easily, you know, in, in fights. So that was, of course, a, a disadvantage when, when fighting against the Spaniards. So there was some kind of technological advantage, obviously, on the side of the Spaniards, but that would never have uh, been sufficient to... Uh, win these war if it hadn't been for other factors yeah well let's then fast forward a little bit to uh cortez when he arrives and um his march towards tenochtitlan happens um let's talk a little bit about this campaign first i guess we haven't talked too much about cortez but um just just briefly what was what was cortez's role once he arrived with um, all of his his mercenaries in the Americas. What was what was his role? Um, what was he seeking out to do? And then how did he come upon Tenochtitlan? Well, first of all, he did not arrive with a group of mercenaries in the New World. He was rather, you know, one of those uh, younger sons. Or well, he was not a younger son. He he was the first. He was first and only son of his father. But uh, one of these people of the lower aristocracy who did not have much uh, uh, chances in life in in the in the uh, in Spain and in the uh, Iberian Peninsula after the wars against the Arabs had been had been fought, and so he was looking for a new life, for a chance, for some opportunities, uh, like all the other Spaniards too. He wanted to get rich and he wanted to uh, get fame and uh, what, what uh, you know, a young aristocrat of his time would look for. And so he went to the new world and he came there and he did have some relatives, you know, not but brothers and so, but but rather father uh, uh, relatives uh, where he would um, um, show up and say, here, here I am, can you help me in getting started? And so he, he did have, of course, a privileged start as compared to the commoners, but uh, he had to go through, uh, uh, you know, many, many different um, uh, 
jobs, so to say, until becoming the mayor of a town in Cuba and uh, was considered to be uh, an audacious and, and also kind of quite intelligent younger leader when, when in 1519 the governor of Cuba finally had the idea of, of sending an expedition to the mainland. Uh, but Cortes, uh, of course, uh, pretty soon um, developed an, uh, a high sense of, of independence and wanted to do his own thing. So uh, he started the expedition and he did, he did so contrary to the to the order of the governor who in the last moment tried to prevent him from going so he just so rounded we, up a big group of of these mercenaries yeah he has like rounded up become. a big group of 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 warriors to to accompany him and then with the three ships he sent uh, he set out to to the mainland uh, but already you know against the orders of the governor so uh, he was already Fall, had already fallen from grace, so to say. And so for him personally, it was not possible to go back because he knew that he would be hanged <laughs> if, if he got back. So, so he had to, you know, he was condemned to be successful. Otherwise, uh, it would not, uh, would not work out well for him. His soldiers, of course, as I said before, many of them were kind of frustrated from their uh, uh, existence in Cuba and were looking out for a new challenge. And, and they put all their luck into the hands of Cortes and, and went with him. But when they were finally there and found out what it was, um, what it was, they had to fight against. Many had second thoughts and had wanted to go back. And, but uh, uh, Cortes, of course, did not have the 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 chance to go back he knew uh, that uh, the revenge of the governor would be kind of mortal for him and so uh, he had to stay on the ground and he made his troops uh, follow him and, uh, and he was so seeking he was... gold is that correct not necessarily yes conquest? they were seeking gold but uh, once uh, they had found out that uh, um, this was this there was this huge empire out there they had uh, uh they were facing they would uh cortez's idea was also to to gain that empire for his king because you know he knew he wouldn't he wouldn't get the grace of his governor again so what he did was he considered himself under the direct command of the king and in order to uh, satisfy the king's demands he knew that in the end the new world would have to produce the riches that everybody had hoped for when in 1419 or 1493 the news of this big uh, exploration had finally reached Europe, you know. But then, of course, in the 30 years that followed, there was not that much riches coming to, to Europe. And, and uh, Cortez, Cortez's thinking was, if, if I make it to produce riches and also to uh, uh, present my my king, um, you know, this highly developed uh, empire as a gift. Then I would, uh, uh, it wouldn't matter that the governor that I had betrayed the governor, but I would be fine. And and that was his reasoning, and and that was actually uh, the uh, ideas that he was following. It may explain his uh, uh, motivation. So talk about when he reaches Tenochtitlan, when Cortez and his men are, they're at the doorstep of Tenochtitlan. What happens? How do, how do events transpire between Cortez and the, um, the Aztecs? Yes, this is also another world historical movement. You know, the troops finally, after a long and arduous uh, uh, expedition through uh, the mainland of Mexico, or what now is Mexico, had made it uh, to the to the valley of Mexico, and what they had seen from afar had already, you know, been beyond their imagination. All these powerful, huge buildings, the temple. Uh, uh, circuit with with these huge uh, pyramid and so on. So they had seen that and they were baffled. And now that they were going down uh, the mountain range to the island there, to the to the island city of Tenochtitlan, they were received actually by the Aztecs uh, on one of the of the bridges they had built. 
and they were received in a very ceremonious manner, in a ritualistic manner, by the very Tlatuani himself in, in a highly uh, um, organized uh, ceremony. And uh, uh, of course, what really happened, we don't know. We just know what Cortes said. And Cortes, uh, in his uh, famous letters to the king, in his Cartas de Relacion, uh, says that uh, uh, in this first contact, the king of the Aztecs had already uh, submitted himself to the rule of this foreign king and uh, uh, that uh, uh, Cortes had taken him more or less uh, in, in, in the place of the king in, uh, as a new, as a new uh, um, vessel of, of his own king. Of course, it's highly dubious that that mattered, uh, that that happened. Um, but what is true is that uh, the Aztecs actually led the Spaniards and their allies, and that is most important. That were not just a few hundred Spaniards, but their allies, including the Tlaxcaltecans, into their city. They had, they took them in. They hosted them, they gave them the palace of uh, Moctezuma's father to live in, and uh, uh, they treated them as guests of honor, so to say. And uh, until this very day, historians do not really know what was the uh, strategy that Moctezuma had in mind when, when doing that. And uh, of course, that was a, a crucial moment because once these Spaniards and their allies were in the city, uh, events would develop that uh, the Aztecs could not completely control anymore. My own thesis is that they thought having them in the city would give them the power to control these, you know, foreigners, which they could not really, really tell uh, what they were about, what they wanted and, and what they were. And so they, they probably thought that it would be good to have them and treat them well, but at the same time, you know, have them more or less under custody. But as it turned out, that was not uh, what happened. Yeah, it does seem like, so Tenochtitlan itself, you know, it's, it's an island in the middle of a lake and it seems like a pretty protected place. I mean, do you think that had uh, Moctezuma not let Cortes in, that he would have been able to conquer the city at all? Well, that's a good question. Of course, it's it's hard to tell. We know that later on he did, uh, because Cortes and and uh, his allies they had to flee the city after the the, the events of the Noche Triste, the the, the sad night, and then they uh, waged a big war. For of siege and and which in the end would be successful but uh, and as i said before you know for cortez there was not much of an alternative than to wage a, a successful war so he would have probably continued but um so how many with his allies in total what is cortez's full fighting force yeah we don't know that exactly because cortez uh, obviously is silent about that in order to uh make his own um, effort uh, more important than it actually was. But we have to think about a couple of thousand people uh, who were fighting on his side. And also numbers were changing because uh, depending on the luck in the warfare, you know, some city would at one day side with uh, Cortes and his allies. And then, you know, when they were fought back by the Aztecs, they would change sides back again. So it was a very dynamic uh, situation. But basically, uh, uh, the mainstay of Cortes's troops was, of course, his own uh, Europeans, and then uh, the Tlaxcaltecans, and, and later on, also the people from uh, partly uh, from Texcoco and so on. So that was a, uh, and, and the more the power of the Aztecs faded, the larger the number of uh, Aztec uh, troops became. So the, what's, what's uh, of, of Cortes's troops became, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the number of, um, I'm sorry, not what's the number, what's the time span from the time that Cortes enters Tenochtitlan to when it falls? And um, if you could just talk about the moment when things turn between Cortes and Moctezuma and 
the conflict actually starts it becomes a conflict yeah 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 um actually we're talking about a period of not 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 completely two years now uh, and um the things start to turn in 1520 when there was a, a big fiesta a, a big uh, ceremonial uh, uh party going on in in Tenochtitlan and uh, when Cortes actually had to leave the city in order to fight uh, other Spanish troops who had been sent out by the governor of Cuba in order to pursue Cortes and to punish him actually so Cortes went out of the city of of um, uh, uh Tenochtitlan with a large group of soldiers in order to find fight against his his own uh, European uh, uh, people so to say and uh, he managed to do so quite successfully and actually uh, uh, gained strength from that because he incorporated the troops that this uh, uh, people who had been sent out by Governor Velasquez of Cuba. When he came back, he found out that uh, uh, things had gone ha havoc in Tenochtitlan. And why? Because his lieutenant, Pedro de Alvarado, had uh, used the festivities of the Aztecs in order to massacre uh, a large part of the of the Aztec elite, which had assembled there in order to, to celebrate peacefully, uh, their flower dances and so on, and he had massacred them. And, and of course, that was the turning point. There was no way back to a peaceful co coexistence, and they were now uh, the, the Europeans now found themselves uh, besieged by the Aztecs. And in the course of the uh, fights uh, that were developing from there, the uh, Tlatuani, the ruler Moctezuma, whom they had earlier taken hostage, uh, died, and 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 then you know the situation uh, developed to be worse and worse, and and in the end the Spanish had to flee to Nochtitlan uh, uh, in what they called the sad night. Of course, for the Aztecs that was the victorious battle of the uh, uh, of the dams and and uh, in the end uh, uh, you know this um, group this uh, gang of, of Spaniards and their allies who who survived they had lost all their gold on on the flight and uh, but uh, they were lucky to to come away with their lives and and then they had to uh, um, to go to Tlaxcala and regroup and and uh, to uh, you know heal their wounds and so on, but they came back stronger and then finally they actually made it. They uh, with of course with uh, the big support of many different indigenous groups who by then uh, had already taken the note that the Aztecs were not uh, uh, you know invincible. They were. Uh, <laughs> They were uh, prone to uh, military defeats, and that, of course, stimulated the long-held uh, hope of of getting rid of the um, uh, of the of the onerous uh, oppression by the Aztecs. So, when somebody says uh, somebody came up to you and said, "Stefan um, uh, Cortez and four hundred of his men took uh, Tenochtitlan." Why would you then say no? That's not that's not the case. Yeah, uh, because it's so obvious that they could never have been uh, have succeeded in doing so without the assistance and actually uh, without following uh, those very warlike indigenous groups who for many many decades had already fought against uh, the Aztecs and who were now willing to risk uh, uh, it and to fight against the Aztecs and to join the forces. And uh, um, we know that and we also know how how history is, of course, uh, a treacherous thing. Uh, if we look at the sources and uh, the sources from Spanish hands have for centuries dominated our vision of the of that war. And of course, in these uh sources uh the indigenous impact is hardly mentioned because it would have 
diminished uh, the, Span the Spanish glory, so to say. And uh, um, from that point of view, we now know, thanks also to the research that has been done by many leading ethno-historians who have taken a second look at indigenous documents, um, that this indigenous impact was actually decisive. We might even go so far as to say that it were the indigenous people who co-opted this small band of Spaniards and, and took them with them because, of course, they did have some sort of um, uh, 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 symbolic power with them because of their animals and of their firearms and so on. But that in itself would never have been sufficient to to bring down the powerful city of Tenochtitlan. And then, of course, there is this other uh, factor that I have to mention, and that is the germ warfare of, of the Spaniards, uh, the, the germs that they brought with them with the Europeans and which sparked off a major epidemic in Mesoamerica uh, to which at crucial points in the war, uh, for example, the successor of, of Moctezuma succumbed and, and died, and, and then uh, many of the uh, ethnic people of their elites died. And also on the of course, there were also the indigenous allies of the Spaniards died, but the Spaniards took advantage of that by placing new rulers uh, on top of these indigenous allies who were dependent upon them. And so in the end, it all worked out so well for the Spaniards, but that was mainly coincidental. And uh, it had to do with the germs and it had to do, of course, also with uh, this uh, powerful presence of the indigenous people who fought their war and in 1521 went out victorious of these wars, but it were the Spaniards who had the vision of subduing the whole region, which the, the single um, indigenous states did not have. They were all happy of, of having gotten rid of uh, the, the uh, Aztec burdens, but uh, none of them had the idea of, of uh, building right away or right from scratch a new empire Aztec style now with, for, for example, Tlaxcala as a center. They didn't have that. But the Spaniards did have that. And, and finally, because of the factors I just mentioned, turned out to be victorious and to build this new empire. Yeah. And, you know, I have heard often the fact that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but something like 90% of the indigenous population of North America died from disease that when is true, yeah. Europeans came over. And that just, that blows my mind. I mean, just yeah. imagine 90% of your town perishing. Yeah. I mean, that's apocalyptic. Yeah. And, and that you really- know, Not, not all of them perished from, from disease, but many also perished from the very fact, you know, that the whole uh, productive system was disrupted. Uh, there was no, no peasants anymore to- to uh, work in the fields and so on. So there was a hunger uh, ep epidemia uh, uh, going hand in hand with, uh, the, uh, uh, with, with the illnesses and so on. And so that all uh, really had devastating effects. And if we compare it to the pandemics of our own days, of course, we might, we might see the difference. This is really the huge democratic demographic catastrophe of human history that is what happened in the americas in that period yeah well kind of lastly um uh, my question for you is is this topic you know why is this well one like if uh, i'm curious if there are any other myths or um any anything else that you found in your research um, that you found to be especially noteworthy uh, when it comes to some of the myths we have about this period of time, but also to just the lessons that um, that we have for today, what what you would like your readers to be taking away from your book? Yeah, there's of course the myth of Quetzalcoatl. You know this idea that uh, the indigenous, the, the the Aztecs mistook the Spaniards for gods who had returned the the feathered uh, snake Quetzalcoatl, which is uh, a real god in the in the, in the Aztec pantheon, and we now know, of course, that although uh, 
this belief might have played a role at the very beginning in when the when the indigenous tried to find out who these foreigners were uh, they soon found out that uh, there were no gods they had to face but rather human beings kind of strange human beings very stinking and, uh, and 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 very funnily dressed but they were now gods but um of course what the Aztecs also believed was and in that they were not so different from Europeans in the time that the the um the um, world beyond that the world of ghosts and of gods and spirits and so on might have an impact on on their own lives on their real world and so um that was something that uh they considered or they might have considered we don't know but they might have considered the spaniards uh to be uh you know at some points uh, having some kind of uh, supernatural powers and so on but they definitely did not consider them uh, uh gods who had returned until the very end and and as what to take away from from the whole uh story i'm telling i think is that we should be very careful when uh um thinking about european superiority and uh when thinking about uh the basis of uh, colonialism we should think twice and we we should really delve into the sources in order to find out which other factors might have been crucial in bringing about the outcomes that we are familiar with in our case of course uh, we now know that it was uh, a war that was not just fought between some few Spaniards and and the powerful Aztecs but it was a, a war that was fought by many different um, indigenous groups together with the Spaniards against uh, an Aztecs empire which also had allies uh, some of whom remained but most of who finally changed sides and and so it it, it is much more uh, um, a gray zone than a black and white zone in in, in what direction you might uh, want to have it. Wonderful. Um, well, Stefan, thank you so much for, for joining me here today. What a fascinating topic. Um, thank you, I, AJ. You know, it was wonderful yeah. to talk to you. It was really a lot of fun. Absolutely. Actually, I've written another book about Latin America in the First World War, which you might be interested in, in yeah. at some other point. <laughs> what is, what's the name of it? It's uh, Latin America and the First World War. It was published by Cambridge University Press okay. in uh, 2017. So quite All right. a few years ago. But if you're, I don't know if you're only into the most recent books or. Well, you know, I'm. I don't. I don't discriminate. Um, you know, whatever uh -huh. I think is interesting is is what I pick up. Um, well, thank you for letting me know. And you've you've written. 14 other books uh anything that you're working on right now is it number well, 15 actually, on its way uh, right now i'm 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 doing smaller things actually i'm i'm writing a couple of articles i'm i'm a little out of the war uh, history kind of thing i'm more into political history cultural history yeah okay um well uh stefan rinke Conquistadors and Aztecs, A History of the Fall of Tenochtitlan. Uh, go buy a copy. Go check it out from your library. What a fascinating topic. And uh, Stefan, again, thank you so much. Thank you, AJ. It was a pleasure.